of hopefully a series of events. This is a one-on-one -on -one with Franz Schwartz. And for that purpose, I'd like uh, to welcome very warmly Franz with us. Hi, Franz. Hi, Flavio. Uh, hi, everyone. It's a, it's a pleasure uh, to be with you. We are very much looking forward to this uh, conversation, maybe for all of you who do not yet know Franz Schwartz. I mean, first of all, this one-on-one -on -one with Franz is exactly about that, to get to know Franz a little better from a different angle. Just a short introduction to give you, uh, uh, you know, like uh, maybe an understanding of what sort of leading individual that we're actually talking about. Franz is partnered with Wilmer Hale, and he's also the vice chair of the International Arbitration Practice Group. He's also, uh, amongst many other things, he's a vice president of the Vienna International Arbitration Center. And he's a member of the board of the Swiss Arbitration Association. And if I'm not mistaken, last year you have been uh, nominated by the Republic of Austria to serve as a member of ICSID. And there's probably uh, tons of other things, <laughs> but we will get to that uh, in, in a minute. Before we start with the questions, I'd like to remind uh, the audience here in Zoom, but also uh, outside, that uh, we have received a few questions and you still have the opportunity to ask questions. Those of you who follow us on Zoom can send us questions through the chat uh, and the others uh, send an email. Uh, hopefully you know my personal email that I will see certainly more, more uh, quickly than the others. Um, but I'm, I'm sure we will have plenty of things to talk about, Franz. And I would actually like to dive into that directly. Franz, we, we can follow your CV more or less, be it on LinkedIn uh, or, of course, on the, on the homepage of Wilmer Hill. But we do not really know about your, your youth, you know, like your early days. <laughs> so maybe if you do not mind, a very general question. Tell us a little bit about your, uh, you know, the beginning. You, you were born and raised, if I'm not mistaken, in Vienna, Austria, in the city, is that, is that right? Uh, that's, that's more or less correct. Uh, when you, when uh, you, uh, when you uh, started by saying you wanted to dive into my youth, uh, uh, this is uh, probably the reason why I was a little nervous about this interview, but uh, in, in all seriousness, yes, I, I did grow up in Austria, that is correct. Um, I, uh, I did grow up uh, for the most part in Vienna, although uh, my mother's family is from Corinthia, which is on the uh, uh, on the uh, Italian border um, in the south of Austria, uh, which is actually where I'm now. Um, I have a I have a holiday home here, which I which is one of my favorite places in the world, and which uh, uh, has become a uh, a study place or workplace during the pandemic as well. I, I understand. Certainly off to a bad start when only 50% of my question is actually correct. <laughs> but I, there's a... oh, I, you know, I'm, I'm adding something that perhaps you didn't know, and that's the purpose of the oh. interview, right? Which, uh, which would uh, tell me that you also speak uh, Italian, or that's my assumption. That uh, all my cousins do who actually grew up here properly. Um, uh, I don't. Um, and, uh, you know, I speak just the tiniest fraction of Italian. Um, I love Italy, uh, who doesn't? Um, and I can find my way around a restaurant, but, uh, but that's the extent of, of my Italian, probably also the extent of my French in many languages. I can navigate the menus in restaurants uh, and that's about it. <laughs> that's pretty, pretty good. And, and probably the, one of the most important aspects of going through everyday life. Um, <laughs> but the, when, you, when you, you said, you, most of the part you were uh, in, in, in your youth, at least in, in Vienna, and I understand that's also where you went to uh, gymnasium, um, to, if I'm not mistaken, the Schotten Gymnasium, but I might yes. be wrong, and I assume that is where, but it's the same circle in, uh, in Vienna City, where we would also find all other um, events of the Wismut, right, the Schotten Bastai or Schotten Tor. That's that's exactly right. It's uh, the 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 Schotten Gymnasium is a high school that's attached to a uh, Catholic monastery, the the Schotten Stift, um, that has been in that part of town since 1156. Um, so it has quite some history, and it's it's part of the uh, of the inner city, the fabric of Vienna. 
Um, and in, in, in that part of my life, uh, my, my radius uh, was, was very small because I went to kindergarten in that area. And then I went to uh, high school in that area. And then I also went to, uh, to law school in that area. As you know, you go from the, from the Schottenstift just across the street to the Juridikum, mm -hmm. uh, which uh, for participants uh, of, the, of the Wismut in Vienna is obviously all very familiar. Um, and that was sort of my, my radius uh, for, for a long time. Nice. Were you, uh, would you say, were you a diligent pupil and a diligent student always? Or is that something that came maybe with aid, <laughs> wisdom? <laughs> it must have come with age. I'm not so sure about the wisdom. Um, I, 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 I probably wasn't Bounds uh, a good, very good student. Maybe I wouldn't consider myself as having been a particularly diligent pupil. Um, my, my talents um, veered strongly towards languages and the humanities um, uh, and uh, philosophy and history and, and the stuff that I found really interesting. Um, uh, I had a much uh, more controversial relationship with mathematics and the natural sciences. That would sort of uh, explain to me I mean, that would still give some sort of a range of options of what you could study afterwards. But why was it law afterwards? I, I have to say uh, the, the uh, sort of the idea to become a lawyer um, was planted in my consciousness, consciousness quite early. Um, and, um, you know, I could give you sort of a lot of a lot of serious explanations for that, but I, I, I think probably the truth is uh, American television. I, I found the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, you know, TV series involving uh, jury trials and the, uh, the drama of the courtroom extraordinarily appealing. Um, and uh, I resolved for that reason also quite early to become a litigator rather than uh, a transactional lawyer. Uh, which, you know, best choice of my life, I think. <laughs> is that, and, and it might be jumping time-wise, but is that one of the reasons why you would have gone, uh, you know, first to do an LLM in London and then maybe even go to a US law firm so you actually get the jury trial sort of experience? Well, again, I wish I could give you sort of a, a, a serious answer that would... Um, reveal sort of a lot of strategy and design and planning in my career progression. Um, but that um, I think is, wouldn't be true. Um, it was uh, much more coincidental than that. Um, I, I did feel that, you know, when I, when I had finished uh, law school and vocational training and all that in Austria, um, that I did want to go to a common law country. Um, and I was looking at the US, I was looking at the UK. The UK had the advantage at the time being a European Union member and Austria had just uh, joined not too long before the European Union. I wanted to get some EU law as well. So I went to LSE for my master. Um, and then really, you know, quite accidentally came across uh, Wilmer Hale, who uh, at the time, Wilmer Cutler Pickering, um, uh, had a um, organized a uh, uh, recruiting reception uh, in London, which was which was very different to uh, the other recruiting events that happen, you know, all the time for LLM students. You have these big firms, and they give you a PowerPoint presentation and explain to you why they're the best firm. Then you get a glass of uh, bad wine, for which you are grateful because you're a student and it's free, um, and. Wilmer really was was uh, was exceptionally different um, in the sense that people, you were required to send in your CV in advance, um, and then and then they would uh, people would actually have read your CV um, and then they would talk to you about your CV and your background at the reception. So there was always um, an interest in you in the person, which I found really refreshingly different and which drew me very much to the firm from the outset. Um, and when you were drawn to the firm, 
was that starting in London directly or were, would you then start in, in a US based uh, firm of Wilmer Hale? No, I, I did start in London directly. Um, there was a, a, a guy there at the time, uh, Dieter Lange, uh, mm -hmm. who was a, a German fellow and, and the sort of European head. And he was looking for sort of a junior um, German speaking lawyer um, to help with his business. He was very much sort of a, a very old school trusted advisor to CEOs uh, around the world. Um, I thought that was a had nothing to do with arbitration. I thought though that was a really interesting opportunity. And I, I barely, as an Austrian, I barely qualified on the German speaking part, but uh, I did get the job and uh, um, did then work for and, and with Dieter Lange, who was a great mentor and, 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 and friend. And he's, he, he passed a few years ago, um, but he's still very much uh, with us in spirit in, in, in the London office. Mm -hmm. When but it was so I understand it was not necessarily through the work with Mr. Lange that you would then get in touch uh, with arbitration when and where was the first time was it even before maybe you know like in an internship or was it uh, with Wilmer Hale no it was with Wilmer Hale it was not before with an internship um, and, and arbitration quite frankly was not a um, sort of dedicated area of study um, at university uh, either in Vienna or um, at the LSC. Um, I think it really developed a bit later as a dedicated study in, in many field of study in many universities. I did know I wanted to be a litigator. I was interested in that and, and Wilmer was always sort of very focused on, on litigation or on, on controversy. Um, but arbitration, the first contact was about six months or so after I had started with Wilmer. Um, uh, a fella comes into my office, his name is Gary Bourne, and he says, um, Franz, um, I have an arbitration case and it involves um, a German party, it involves German law. Um, uh, I would like you to work on that, if that's okay with you. I've spoken to Dieter Lange and he's willing to, to share you for the purpose. Um, and I said, yeah, absolutely, sure. You know, as you do as a junior associate, both because it is a matter of, uh, of uh, political survival. And secondly, because um, it's, uh, it sounded like an interesting and, and fun thing to do. Um, and so I did. Um, Gary did tell me something else at the, uh, at the time. He said, uh, uh, but don't get any wrong ideas. Um, this, this is really a one-off thing for you. Um, I don't think... Um, you know, a career in arbitration is the thing for you because you're not a native English speaker um, and in a field that is so heavily dependent on advocacy you will always have a disadvantage vis-a-vis uh, -vis the native speakers. And um, I, you know, <laughs> the, the reason that this immediately comes to mind obviously um, shows how much a chord it struck at the time. I am convinced by now that it was um, uh, reverse uh, psychology uh, and, and the added motivation that he thought would, uh, would push me um, towards the field rather than away from it. Yeah, and as we will hear uh, later on, uh, he was quite wrong about the adv about advocacy part, wasn't he? <laughs> yeah, but exactly. Maybe that's, maybe that's, uh, maybe he, uh, that was his way of, of saying you can do it, but you need to push yourself extra hard. Yeah. Uh. Wow, that's that's quite a story. How many times did you tell Gary since then? <laughs> I, I don't know. If, I don't think uh, he should watch this interview. I don't think I've told him. Um, uh, Gary, if you're watching this, uh, this is what you've done. <laughs> <laughs> well, certainly a win-win, I would say. That's good. <laughs> but, um, how was it for you to work in that, uh, well, basically US firm, but uh, in, in London? How was it for you? I mean, you were one of the few then from, uh, let's call it, well, Central Europe in that sense. Or yeah, I think I was, I was the first experiment. Um, there, there was maybe sort of a, uh, one or two Germans, obviously there was Dieter Lange, but on the associate side, um, I, was, I was the first um, uh, sort of junior experiment uh, for the firm. Um, and, and that changed very, very quickly, um, uh, particularly in the arbitration group where we then had, I think as one of the first um, practices a really, really diverse international group uh, with a very, very strong continental European um, 
uh, uh, part to it. Um, uh, so, so yeah, what was your question? <laughs> yeah, no, uh, yeah, how, how was it for you to work like, in the like, I feel like a witnessing for... cross-examination who's gone <laughs> off, off track. Yeah, not, that was not my question. So. <laughs> um, how was it for you? You know, like also culturally, because right. uh, you, you probably have done uh, first internships and you did, I think, the Austrian bar first before you moved then to London. And uh, no, I actually, I, I actually had completed most of my my, my Austrian education, but I, I had to go back at some point and, and took a break from Wilma for the Austrian bar exam that I had not um, then completed. The Austrian system is sort of very extended with long periods of, of practical work uh, in between and various various layers and so forth. Mm -hmm. um, but culturally, I found it um, I found it really easy, um, and I think that's. Um, that's true for many American firms. Um, it's certainly true for Wilma that the that the hierarchies are really flat. Um, that it's a pretty informal atmosphere, um, and that it really values sort of uh, initiative, teamwork, all these things. Um, and and I felt it was um, very suited to my personality, uh, particularly the flat hierarchy part. Mm -hmm. Is uh, Wilmer Hale, you know, I mean, it's, it's, it's a huge law firm, particularly if you look at from, from my eyes, from Wenger and Bielli, honestly. Um, is, while, while it has so many different offices, is it uh, internationally the same sort of firm culture? Or would you say any office has its own sort of subculture within the firm? I think it's a, I think it's a, I think it's a bit of both. Um, it's probably a little bit like Switzerland because, um, you know, I, my impression is that people identify, identify very strongly with, for example, Zurich uh, or with Basel or with Geneva. Um, but then they also identify very strongly with being Swiss, right? So I think identity is always or often a matter of concentric circles. And um, in that same way, I think there is a there's a particular culture of an office. There's a particular culture of, of different groups, certainly of the arbitration group. But there is also a, uh, a firm culture um, that pervades the, the practice groups and the offices. And, you know, I've spent most of my professional life at Wilma, so I haven't seen from the inside a lot of other firms. Um, but I do think that our firm culture um, overall is, is, is actually very, very strong. Um, and you see sort of this, you know, the passion about law um, is certainly a denominator and um, uh, the, the, the strive for excellence. And I know it sounds sort of like a, like a sort of branding exercise, but uh, um, I, I meet so many of my, my colleagues um, in various parts of the firm and, um, and they are just really, really impressive. Um, and um, uh, also a strong sense of collegiality, um, which again sounds like like an exercise in branding, but but in my experience has has been really enormous um, uh, and a source of of great great joy, sort of in in the firm. How you know in in many cases today you work across practice groups, um, uh, IP or, or um, other areas from an, as an arbitration lawyer and. Uh, even with people that you don't know so well, I found uh, you, you get along and you have this sort of shared understanding of what you want to achieve. And, and mm -hmm. that's, I think, is a, is, a, is a testament to the culture. Mm -hmm. Something that is, um, well, particularly true for Wilmer Hale, if I'm not mistaken, is also its devotion to pro bono work. And uh, Wilmer Hale has received many awards and the deserved recognition for that work. Um, <clears throat> for you, uh, how, how much is pro bono, if at all, a part of your work in daily life? Um, it's, uh, so it's in, in, in one sense, it's, it's certainly driven uh, from, from the US and it's a little easier to do that sort of work in the US um, on a domestic level, you know, be it, representing, um, uh, you know, people wrongly convicted on death row, which the, where the firm has done amazing work um, uh, to immigration matters, um, 
uh, university issues uh, and, and, and all that stuff. It's a little bit more difficult as an international lawyer um, um, to get in, engaged in, in, in that, but I think we've done a pretty good job. Uh, we've done, we've helped from the arbitration group um, on, on some Guantanamo Bay representations, um, and this is now some time back that involved issues of the definition of enemy combatant under the Geneva Conventions and so forth. Um, we've done obviously the, the Sudan arbitration, which we um, took on uh, pro bono. Um, some of my colleagues at the moment are doing investor state arbitration for small investors um, uh, on, a, on a pro bono basis. Um, so, wow. um, and, and some of our some of our colleagues in London are involved um, with their local communities and, and with the local bar um, and, and, and are exploring pro bono opportunities um, as well. So it's something that we take very seriously. Um, we, uh, my, my partner, Steve Finicio has done a lot of work, for example, for journalists um, uh, in various parts uh, of, of the world that were uh, pressured by government. So it's something that, that we take very seriously. And, and, and obviously um, if, if there are issues of international law that arise, uh, then we are super happy to help and get involved. Yeah. Well, so it's fair to say that's another the denominator within the firm then that you have such a strong commitment to it. For me, just quickly stay maybe with the pro bono work. Uh, it's more, maybe more uh, fundamental. Uh, I, I probably considered pro bono work uh, from its, uh, you know, origin in Latin pro bono publico as some sort of a commitment to uh, to justice, you know, gen generally saying. And if we think about justice, um, not necessarily just pro bono work, but, you know, like doing something for justice, what is your view? Um, do arbitration practitioners have sort of a moral, ethical, legal duty to serve and provide justice? I mean, the, the, the uh, um, immediate duty of um, arbitrators in the process of arbitration is uh, a contractual one um, under their agreement to arbitrate, to discharge the duty and resolve the dispute between the parties, right? Um, that is a... Um, rather pragmatic approach, I'd say. Um, and as with any judicial body, as with any court, um, as with any arbitration panel, as with any international tribunal, it's an application of the whatever law applies in the dispute. And in an ideal world, um, the, the result is um, that the, the, the divergence between the right outcome and the just outcome uh, is not too different. Um, and uh, I think that's one thing. I think the, the, the other thing is that this field opens quite unique opportunities uh, for practitioners to get involved um, in various ways um, in, in sort of bigger issues, right? Um, uh, be that, you know, border disputes, be that um, uh, assistance in transitional work, um, helping jurisdictions sort of reform the legal systems. Um, and uh, in that sense, you know, there's, there's an opportunity and therefore also a responsibility um, for the field more generally um, to, uh, um, to help and assist and, 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 and work pro bono in the sense that you've, that you've now identified it. I would agree with that. And, and I think we see a lot in the field uh, happening in that regard, um, you know, the, the green arbitration initiatives that we see, um, that's obviously also something where I think many in the field can lead by example and, and, and hopefully make a difference. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's another notion probably or part of the notion of, of justice, that's absolutely correct. If we, if we stay again and take it back to the pragmatic part uh, in a sense of, you know, like sometimes being counsel or I mean party representative, uh, we might be a little bit be a tour in between what the client expects us to do and what we would consider as right or just to do. I mean, blunt or, or put it differently, 
is everything that is just legal, should we also do it as council, as party representatives? Or do you believe we should reach for a higher goal? So actually the client's interests are, do not prevail over what we consider as actually, you know, justice or whatever sort of um, maximum threshold you, we expect from ourselves. Um, I mean, uh, that, that obviously is a question that is much easier answered in, in, a, in a concrete case, right, uh, than it is in the abstract. Um, I've uh, not, thankfully, not come into a situation where I felt that uh, the client's interests were so different from uh, an ethical or just uh, pursuit of, of a claim or a defense um, that it would have raised an issue for me. Um, I've had situations where, um, you know, the, the, the client's expectations for the process um, was perhaps different. Um, and I think, and I would think the same applies for more difficult questions in, in these circumstances. Um, absolutely, you need to um, stick to your ethical guns, as it were, uh, and you just need to have a very frank discussion with the client. Um, I do think that um, your, your professional integrity and your credibility um, are um, tremendously important um, to win a case and persuade a decision maker. Um, and for that reason, it's both the right thing to do, but I think it's also in the client's interest um, to um, adhere to the highest ethical standards um, because you know, you develop a reputation as someone who does, and that I think um, uh, makes people listen perhaps um, a little more carefully to what you have to say, which is a good thing. If I may just add a question here, when you think about your own reputation, assuming that you, you know it, uh, and I'm not saying I do it, but if you think about it, what, what would you say is your reputation or maybe your credo um, <laughs> as a practitioner? Um, I, would, I would hope that it's, uh, it's, it's the passion for the field that, that shines through. Um, the, the joy that we have in, in doing what we do, it's a huge privilege. Um, and otherwise, I think to talk about one's own reputation is, uh, is, uh, is a bit too self-serving. Uh, so. <laughs> it's okay, we'll, we'll, we'll do a, a survey on that and then we'll let you know. <laughs> no, 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 I'm just kidding. <laughs> let me maybe take you a step back from, from where it started for you as, um, as a partner. If I'm not mistaken, uh, in let's call it maybe Swiss general terms, you became partner quite youngish at 37, 38, if I'm not mistaken. I think I might, might have even be a, a bit younger. I see. Uh, th then that's certainly young. <laughs> um, but how, how was that for you? I mean, becoming partner in a law firm, uh, that certainly comes with a lot of positive, uh, you know, feelings. But would you say that you were also a little bit frightened, concerned, you know, apprehensive of what may come? Or was it just overjoyed and positive outlook? It's a good question. I think I, I remember it as a as a as a, uh, as a positive thing. Um, not 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 surprisingly, it's something that one one works towards. Obviously, um, I also remember it as as uh, uh, giving sort of a. a uh, a sense of freedom to to take the practice also to sort of take personal responsibility for the practice and how we develop it um, and that that I think uh, uh, is my is my strongest memory of it of, of, of the moment um, if, if you allow let me take you maybe to a few other questions um, and I, I'd start this off with a little poem um, that I would like to read to you. It's super short, I, I promise. It's called uh, No Place Like Home. And I quote, Amid pleasures and palaces, though we may roam, 
be it ever so humble, there's no place like home, unquote. Um, the author is unknown. Pardon me? Uh, the, the author is unknown. I, did, I didn't find Okay, okay, it. I see. I, I don't know. It, it certainly wasn't me. <laughs> for you, you have been working and traveling, obviously, the world, and you've been working from London, Frankfurt, and Austria. Where is the place that you would call home, or maybe starting before, what do you define as home? That's that, that is a question that I that I have some difficulty answering, and 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 even though I'm um, I'm thinking about it a lot actually. Um, uh, maybe as one gets gets a bit older, these these things become more rather than less important. Um, I, uh, I I do feel at home um, at this point as much in England as I do in Austria. I think it's possible for a person to have two homes in that sense. Uh, with emotional attachment and all that. Um, I do think that um, uh, the value of sort of family, you know, my parents, uh, my cousins, my best friends from growing up um, uh, speak in favor of Austria uh, on the emotional attachment side. And, and, and that is a very important part. And, and, and I think that's, that's uh, makes Austria a bit more of a home than England still, even after all that time, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. Yeah, that makes absolute sense. It sounds, I, I don't know, we might get to that afterwards, but, uh, you know, th there's one song particularly, and I'm just going to, I'm just going to say that line, uh, wherever I lay, my head is home. I said that might be, there's certainly a, uh, the opportunity or the, the possibility to have different homes. I, I would fully agree with you. And, uh, at some point, at some point, it felt uh, uh, like home was uh, uh, British Airways. Um, but uh, uh, these times, but the food killed it. <laughs> <laughs> the food killed it. Um, thankfully, these times are are uh, are behind us. At least, at least so now. The, the last year allowed us all to. Uh, to recalibrate, I think, uh, uh, our lives in that sense, um, which is also why I'm spending some time in Austria now. It's, yeah. it's, a, it's a good opportunity. Since you, you know, like, uh, since you refer to those last times, and particularly the last uh, year or a little bit more, how has it affected your life? Um, you know, professionally, but also personally, you know, like... Um, yeah, I guess less travels, but but did it also raise fundamental questions for you suddenly? As as we were talking now about home, is that something that you know you st <laughs> sort of came up more now? Or I think it has in a sense. Um, uh, I think the you know very awkward feeling when you when 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 the crisis hit um, uh, in March uh, of last year. Um, the first time sort of that you're that you're confronted with where home is um, uh, in particular because you might be stuck in a place for a considerable period of time and unable um, to to go somewhere else right um, and um, uh, I particularly for that reason you know uh, thinking for example about my mother who's uh, now in her in her 70s, um, the sense of being able um, to be closer and um, uh, and help if needed. Um, I think that define, sort of redefined home for me um, uh, in, a, in a different way um, than it had perhaps in, in previous years. Uh, professionally, I think we are in a, in a very, very privileged position as arbitration lawyers um, to continue to do what uh, what we do, we obviously had all had to adapt. Um, uh, testament to this, not not least um, the fact that we are having this uh, in Zoom via Zoom and not in person. Um, you know, online hearings, uh, interacting with your own team. Um, uh, you know, helping people to um, uh, manage uh, the demands of their personal and professional lives at this time. I mean, this is something. That we all had to do, um, and I still think we had to, we we could do it from a from a privileged position because uh, 
uh, at least we you know were able to continue uh, in in our professional uh, careers. I f I fully agree. I fully agree. Yeah. If we if you were to start, I mean, this is maybe a little unrelated to the last year, but you know, maybe maybe it does make a difference. Um, if you were to think back and you we were to start again as 25 year old or a 30 year old, would you again enter into the same field knowing what you know now? I, 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 I hesitate with a with a, with an answer because I think there is no there's not really an easy answer to that question. I mean, part of it is what I described earlier um, that I didn't even at the time <laughs> when I was twenty five or twenty six and I started with Wilma, I I didn't make a conscious decision to enter uh, uh, into the field of arbitration. Um, it was it was Gary coming coming into my office and asking me to join one case and and then it grew into something right so um, I didn't I didn't make that conscious decision that that is what I wanted to do um, so I have difficulties to start with to say would I make that decision again because I never made it um, <laughs> if someone asks me is it is a great is it a great field to work in um, then the answer is obviously yes um, I think it is. For me, and I think for many others, the best uh, and perhaps only conceivable field of law um, to to work in um, uh, for many reasons. Um, it is certainly um, a more crowded field than it was when I started. Um, it's uh, more difficult, not easier to become to become partner. Um, although that's not the end all and be all of everything, but um, for many, still an important step. Um, and um, uh, probably because it's more crowded, um, also more difficult to to make a name for yourselves and for self and 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 strike out. So, um, whatever whatever that means, I do think uh, if you're if you're if you're passionate about what you do, if you if you uh, pursue it, you can make it in any field, and that's probably the the most important thing. You know that you have a realistic um, assessment of your own talents, um, and then. Uh, infuse those talents with 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 passion, um, and and pursue a career. Right, that's that's all you all anyone can ever do, and um, hopefully it works out. Uh, well, I, I would also look at this what you just said as as an advice because I was going to ask you, you know, like whether that would be your uh, key advice to younger people, and I think that's quite a good start with that. I I I think so. I think so too. I think. Um, you know, there in the legal profession, whichever field it is, there are, as you as you know as well, um, hard hours, long hours. Um, uh, you need to put in the work. Um, uh, there are demands on you personally, professionally, etc. Um, but I think more generally, for many professions outside the law, the same is true. And if you, I think the 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 most important starting point is that you choose something that you identify with and that you really enjoy doing um, because that helps you to, to get through the, the more difficult bits, right? Mm -hmm. Is, you know, basically passion and, uh, and your love for what you're doing, is that sufficient motivation and inspiration for you? Or do you draw inspiration from further things uh, in order to pursue the career because I mean it's not as if you would be uh, working uh, nine to five and all the others have the long hours I and mean, uh, you know you <laughs> you have long days still I mean that's what what makes you continue to work and to pursue that that career that you that you have started um, I, I am a fairly strong believer that motivation or inspiration, if you want to call that, has ultimately to come from within oneself. Um, so, so yes, it's still, um, I still think that I have, have uh, something to give I, I, to, to my clients, uh, that I add value, even though, you know, we have a, have a great team and sometimes I think they don't need me. Um, but I do think I have something of, of value to add. And I also have 
I think something to to give to the team in terms of uh, supporting them and um, mentoring them and and uh, um, uh, helping them progress their careers. Uh, and that's for me also an important motivation um, to grow and, and and to grow the team that we have. Knowing knowing you, but also knowing some of your team members. I'm sure that you certainly do inspire your team members. Um, I have no, I have no doubt about that. It's very nice of you to say, Fabio. If I, if I may take you to another aspect, and you, and let me take you to something that you said before. You know, like this uh, short episode with Gary Bourne, and I'm just kind <laughs> of sort of put it in my own words, basically saying you, you know, like. Uh, don't have high hopes because you might not make it with your advocacy skills. In 2010, you were the first one to receive the ASA, so the Swiss Arbitration Association's Advocacy Prize. And that has give, uh, been given out only biannually to very, uh, very distinguished practitioners in the field. Um, and it's sort of funny to hear that story from you, from Gary Bohr, <laughs> given that you were the first one to get that prize. Um, in your view, what makes good advocacy? Um, I, think, I think there are probably two things. Um, one is preparation, um, which sounds <laughs> not not very exciting, but I think is is the is the foundation for any good advocacy. Um, uh, I think uh, uh, the notion that someone sort of by sheer brilliance um, uh, persuades a sophisticated panel is um, uh, is quite romantic, but uh, but uh, uh, you know not not the reality. I think preparation is really important. And then I think the second is authenticity, right? If you, if you um, uh, don't try and, and, and force yourself to be like someone that you're not, uh, don't force yourself to be um, like someone else in your, in your um, advocacy. And that's, you know, in a sense, we all start out like that because we, we see uh, more senior experienced colleagues, um, colleagues that we admire um, uh, do their advocacy. And, and obviously you start out by copying things, right? Um, and um, I think the sooner you realize, and some things are worth being copied. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with that. Uh, but I think you need to develop your own voice and you need to figure out what that is and your own style. And I've seen... Um, sort of so many different styles of advocacy that have really nothing in common, but each uh, being really quite effective. So I, 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 I and, and I think the common denominator really is as different as they were, that they were authentic and worked uh, for the person who, who delivered it. Does that mean that in your team, you would have different styles of advocacy and you would not even try to harmonize uh, the style, but you sort of leave it to the individuals? Um, yes and no. I think we do have a house style um, uh, at Wilmer. Um, it's perhaps stronger in the, uh, in the written advocacy uh, in our submissions than it is in the oral advocacy. Um, in the written advocacy, we do have a house style. We have a way of to analyze and present, um, and um, uh, that has sort of a uh, it's it's a toolbox, right, that people follow, and and on whichever team you are with, whoever you work, uh, it ensures sort of a, a consistency of of quality across. Um, I think that's important. Um, and it still leaves enough freedom for individual flourish, if, if that's your thing. I think oral advocacy is by definition more individualized, right? And obviously we, uh, you know, we, we, we have certain things that we do, I suppose, and some things that probably annoy our opponents and other things that we don't do, um, but um, uh, it, it is much more individualized on the, on the, on the oral advocacy side. Can you share your individual flourish? Can you share the secret or is that the secret ingredient? <laughs> if, I, if I knew my secret, I think, um, <laughs> I don't think I have secrets to share, but uh, um, I, 
uh, I do think I'm, uh, I try to be fairly authentic. Um, and that I think is a, is, a, is a strange way of putting it if you try to be authentic. Um, but uh, uh, I, I do think I am in the hearing and I, I, I do think um, a lot about the psychology of, of the situation. Um, uh, because I also think that there is not one, one style um, that works for every witness in cross-examination, quite obviously. You need to, um, to think very carefully of who that person is, how you want to establish um, sort of that strange relationship that you have between asking questions and, and getting answers much as you're doing now very well. Um, and then also how, how it impacts or how it, how it, um, how it looks to the tribunal, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and yeah, that, that's something that I, that I enjoy and spend a lot of time thinking about before I go into a hearing. Have your considerations in that regard, uh, would you say, have they changed in the last, let's say, maybe decade or in the last uh, couple of years? Or uh, is it something like um, r really some sort of a recipe that you can still use pretty much the same way that you used it at the beginning? Um, I don't think it's a, it's a system that changes for me over time in in a revolutionary way that I now say I don't do this anymore or now I uh, have a I've discovered a completely different system it's something <laughs> that I think evolves over time right and with every um, with every experience um, your your um, your body of, of of reference points grows and uh, and you take that with you into the next hearing and then you grow some further and um, I think that's the fun of it, right? That that every hearing and, and every cross examination ultimately is different. Um, rarely do they go um, as planned. Never do they go exactly as planned, and and mm -hmm. and that's the challenge, but also the the joy of doing it. Yeah, that that is that is true. In your view, has you know has has advocacy itself generally changed over the last couple of years? I, I don't, yeah, I don't think in any dramatic way, to be honest, um, uh, is, is, is my view. I think that um, obviously the last year has brought um, some logistical changes with, uh, with a lot of remote hearings. Mm -hmm. um, but my own view is that that is not so terribly different um, from an advocacy perspective uh, from what you have in a in a physical hearing, of course, there are differences, but I don't think it's a fundamental change. Um, it's more a matter of, of adapting to the logistical limitations. Mm -hmm. um, and I think generally, um, maybe, the, maybe the standard overall is, is continuously rising, um, uh, but I don't see any dramatic changes in advocacy. Because I was, you know, <laughs> I was going to ask you whether you had a perception about Trump's presidency, whether that had actually any influence, because uh, I'll tell you honestly, I believe in the cases that I have seen in the last three or four years, the advocacy has become sort of strange that we really started to talk about alternative <laughs> facts, and, you know, like uh, we were... I don't know, but we, we of course believe that we were right. The others telling us that we were uh, Trump-like uh, alleging things. So like he, he has not only been the president of the US, but he has also been a subject of, of certain pleadings. Did, is that anything that you perceive yourself or, or not really? I mean, it's funny that you say that. I do remember a case from about two years ago, three years ago, where um, the other side was quite unashamedly constructing an, a universe of alternative facts. And it was sort of like, <laughs> you just say it. And if you say it often enough, it becomes true. Um, and um, I did think I made in, in, in opening statements a reference to sort of a dystopian Trumpian world where, where this is now acceptable. Um, although I'm, I'm, I'm less sure about the cause and effect, whether people like that uh, really needed Trump to make pleadings like that. Um, uh, that's, <laughs> uh, that's a different question. <laughs> that is true. 
Um, let me maybe, um, well, you could, you could call Trump also uh, a development on the market, but probably of a minor importance. But let's uh, maybe uh, go to something, uh, something else. Uh, I mean, one of the, well, evident developments is, of course, what we had with COVID going virtual and that, that kind of things. Were there any other developments in your view um, that were particularly positive or negative in the arbitration industry that come to your mind? Over the last year or so, or yeah, last or, couple, well, even last five years. or ten years. Yeah. Well, I think, I think um, the the uh, drive towards greater diversity um, uh, is is obviously an an, an important and, and and highly welcome development. I think the drive towards greener arbitration, um, the same. Um, particularly negative developments, um, I'm not sure that I, that I uh, could identify um, at this point. Maybe I'm, I'm just too much of a glass half full um, uh, type of person. <laughs> if, I, if I take a question also from the audience in that regard, I mean, we have, uh, quickly talked about the virtual hearing and there's general a digital let's call it transformation that is a you know a, an upcoming tool maybe what according to you are the limits of arbitration to go let's say virtual to go digitalized maybe also to go to an online platform where do you see really the limits I, I don't know. I think we will see, right? I think, I think you and I talk about limits of of uh, now and tomorrow. The world is a different place because someone else has invented uh, a new way of communicating, um, and 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 it doesn't stand still like that. Uh, um, I, as you can see from my answer, I'm generally quite positive. Feel quite positive about um, uh, the way it's going. I think. Virtual hearings um, are here to stay, uh, maybe not for all cases, um, but if you overlay sort of climate change concerns, there's really no reason why for a, you know, moderately sized hearing, uh, 20 people have to fly around the world. Um, so I think, I think there's real opportunity here that we've taken what we had to learn over the last year and applied constructively going forward. Um, I've seen, I've seen sort of over the last uh, 12 months, how uh, people get more comfortable with it and 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 use the technology better. Um, uh, I've been in a hearing uh, a few weeks ago where uh, we we in the cross examination and and credit goes to my colleague Helmut Ottner for for having the idea, but in the cross examination we actually um, used displayed the uh, the model of the quantum expert. Um, that came in the form, was part of the file uh, as an Excel sheet. Um, and we put that on the screen, um, everyone on video, and then through the questions, performed the live manipulation of the model. If you change that assumption, that would happen. If you change that assumption, this would happen. And um, I, I, I do think that in a purely physical hearing, this would not have worked so well. But now that everyone is is so accustomed to working with what's on a screen, um, it felt really natural to do it that way. And, mm -hmm. and I think as, as sort of the technical um, possibilities uh, only, only get bigger and better, um, we'll see more of that. Yeah, yes. And obviously, I mean, one of the side effects is that it does decrease the costs uh, substantially, at least certain uh, charges. But... <clears throat> Uh, what what is not necessarily achieved yet is that we uh, bring or that we uh, address the criticism of costly arbitrations in general. We have one question from the audience that uh, asks, how can we make arbitration more affordable for small and medium-sized enterprises? Uh, well, first of all, do you agree with the uh, implication there that it is not affordable yet? And second, if you agree, what do you see could be certain means? 
Um, I first of all, I'm not sure that I agree with the with the premise of the question. Um, uh, I think there are many ways, and many institutions have worked very hard uh, on um, introducing rules and mechanisms for smaller claims for expedited proceedings um, that can be done. I think in a very cost-effective way. Um, Still, I think there is no doubt that the technological advances, um, including virtual hearings, um, uh, will make it easier um, to be cost effective if that's if that's the primary driver. Um, and you know, there is obviously a lot of discussion about uh, about uh, artificial intelligence and and uh, in the context of discovery or disclosure. You know, do you? And we've seen a lot of that happening already. I mean, no one. No client is willing to pay 50 lawyers um, any longer to sit somewhere and, and, and read through documents when uh, you can do that electronically. We'll just see more of that and it will bring the cost down and rightly so. Yeah, I agree. We have only a few minutes left, Franz. If you still have five minutes time, sure. I'll just uh, put a few short questions to, to sort of close this up. Um, for young practitioners out there, maybe students, maybe soon to apply, what would you say? Rather write the doctoral thesis or make an LLM? Or do both? <laughs> I'm sorry that I'm, that I'm not offering any, any easy, straightforward answers to any of your questions, but I really think that depends um, very much on your circumstances. Um, that and there are various ways to look at that. You know, do you want to play into your strength? Um, do you want to signal that you have real academic pedigree? Maybe a doctoral thesis is the way to go. Uh, have you had a sort of very domestic um, practice experience so far? Uh, do you do you internationalize it? Um, maybe the LLM is the better choice. So I think it depends really. You know, be smart about it. Think about what what it means and. Do you want to sort of build on your strength or do you want to um, branch out into, into something that you haven't done? What's more helpful to you? Uh, um, so I, I, my, my, way of, my way of advice is always asking more questions. <laughs> and from an employer's perspective, would you, what would you be looking at? Uh, you know, like, would one of them be the, a requirement you know, or even both or not necessarily? Not a requirement, not necessarily. Again, we would look at um, the, the person as a whole and their entire experience and their entire academic background. Um, you know, for particularly for, for uh, um, young colleagues uh, from, uh, from the continent, uh, from the European continent, uh, from, from, from civil law countries and LLM in a common law environment, uh, obviously does add something and, and, and uh, you know, uh, is, is, is perhaps a plus. Uh. At the beginning uh, or in the first part, we were talking a, bit, a little bit on self-branding. So if I, I'm asking you as in the, from the perspective of you being an employer, maybe, why would you say choose Wilmer Hale to all the potential students out there? <laughs> why Wilmer Hale? Well, <laughs> I think for all the reasons that we've discussed today, you know, um, <laughs> it's the uh, it's the combination of um, of I think a, uh, a strong firm culture, uh, great collegiality, um, fantastic cases. Um, uh, I think people um, and an environment in which you're encouraged to learn and to grow um, that pushes you, that challenges you. Um, that gives you the opportunity to work on, on really interesting matters and cases um, and that um, has a strong culture of, of sort of pro bono so that you'll find uh, if, if, if that's the thing for you, you, you have opportunities to give back. How's, how's that for a pitch? That's a pretty, that's a pretty damn good pitch. Do you, want to, do you want to join us, Flavio? <laughs> <laughs> I'll send in my application afterwards. <laughs> but... As, as a future employee, <laughs> I would be asking, why not Wilmer Hale? What is one of the things that you may or may not think of um, that one should be aware of uh, when coming to Wilmer Hale? 
that might be perceived maybe as not the most positive thing if you are allowed to uh, disclose it. I think I would be allowed. I just really, I just really struggle um, to find something that um, uh, I think would, would turn someone away. And quite frankly, um, if there was such a thing, I don't think I would have been with the firm for 20, 22 years. Uh, um, in a time where, you know, there's a lot of change and people do change firms. Uh, we've, we've um, had you know, quite good consistency. Um, and certainly for me, you know, it's a professional home. If, it, if there have been issues in the way that you've described those things that, that I, I would, would be an answer to your question, I, I'm not sure that I would still be here. So uh, I'm here as a reflection that uh, the positive pitch was actually true. <laughs> okay, well, you're also here as an idol uh, to many and uh, I mean you have accomplished so much um, my last question to you is where do you see yourself in 15 years and that's something that an employer usually asks the employee where do you see yourself in years? <laughs> where do you see yourself in 15 years first of all Flavio I, I find the term idle um, uh, really quite embarrassing um, I, I uh, <laughs> Uh, but where do I see myself in 15 years? Um, um, I think the last 12 months have shown, I think the first answer that it would give is healthy and active. Um, that's what I, uh, that's a, what I would really like. Um, and um, secondly, in the field, um, I think there, there are, there's, there are one or two books that I would still like to write about the field. Um, um, and um, otherwise, you know, growing with our team and our group um, and seeing sort of some of the fantastic people that we have in the team uh, being successful, it sounds like, a, sounds like a, a, a bright thing to look forward to. Well, we'll be looking forward to that as well. Um, we uh, hope to see you in the field and I hope to, to read those two books <laughs> as well. <laughs> Um, rather sooner than later. <laughs> I uh, thank you very much for your honest and entertaining and you know all, all the <laughs> all the facets of your responses. It was an absolute pleasure to talk to you, Franz. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Flavio. Thank you for having me. We um, <laughs> we are at the end of this uh, one on one with. Franz Schwartz. Before we really conclude and say goodbye, I'd like to give the word over to Matteo, which I hope is with us. Matteo Bordoni. He's a co-chair of the Institute of Arbitration of BGS. Good afternoon, and, uh, Flavio. I give you the word, Matteo. Oh, I just want to warmly thank uh, Franz Schwartz uh, and you for this really interesting uh, opportunity to get to know him behind the scene of uh, international uh, arbitration. And um, so um, I listened today many key advice. I appreciated that uh, the strive for, for excellence could be achieved by strong sense of collegiality and love for informality that uh, the preparation could be um, unified to authenticity. Thank you very much for this, uh, for this advice. And um, finally, I also take this opportunity to inform the audience that the next episode of One on One With uh, will be scheduled with Professor Maria Beatrice Deli, we, who is a, a professor of international law and secretary general of uh, ICC Italia. Uh, me and uh, our Flavio Peter again, uh, we have the, the honor and the pleasure of uh, conducting the, the interview. So it's up to you, Flavio, for the final greetings. Thank <laughs> you again, uh, uh, Franz Schwartz. Thank you very much. Thank you, Matteo. Thank you very much, Matteo. Thank you again, Franz. And thank you everyone out there over Zoom and uh, live stream on YouTube for joining us. I hope you liked the interview. 
And as you heard, we'll be back by the end of May at the latest with another one-on-one -on -one with Maria Beatrice Deli. Until then, stay safe, take care, and uh, we look forward to seeing you, be it in person or virtually. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Keep safe and healthy, everyone. Thank you.